it's a great pleasure to have Professor Ben Freyvogel from uh, University of Amsterdam. And uh, he's going to speak about uh, a very interesting topic to us, which is wormhole. And uh, uh, with this talk, we are completing basically uh, 51st QSTM Zoominar series because last, last one was the 58th. So this is the 51st. And uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, uh, like uh, giving your consent to give a, this uh, long lecture. And I know that this is a very um, important for us. So like everybody will want to understand like this one whole stuff. And hopefully we can learn a lot from this. And those who do, don't know about Ben's uh, uh, alma mater, just I want to uh, point that Ben did his PhD from Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics, Stanford University uh, under Professor Saskind. Then he did his postdoc at University of California, Berkeley. Then he was at MIT for a certain time. And then he shifted to University of Amsterdam as a faculty. Now there he is continuing. His area of expertise is quantum entanglement, quantum gravity, information theory overlap, and also a DSCFT. So he will uh, today particularly talk about wormhole. So Ben, you can start. And uh, again, thank you for your consent and uh, hopefully we will learn a lot today. All right, well, thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to talk about wormholes. Um, is this kind of an acceptable size of, of writing? So I know it's the trend these days um, to give Zoom talks with an iPad, but I was teaching uh, during this quarter and my students said, no, no, it's better on the blackboard. I tried both things. Um, so that's what I, that's why I'm subjecting you to that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about uh, wormholes and well, to some extent I'll define them more precisely later, but for right now, uh, let me just say that a wormhole is something which kind of looks like a black hole from the outside. But once you fall in it, there's, instead of running into a singularity, you, pass through some um, region and come back out into asymptotic space-time. Um, and if you would have asked me about these things like five years ago, I would have told you that these are science fiction. And I think we've learned over the past few years from interesting works from various people that some wormholes can really exist in, in real life. Um, but not all sorts of wormholes. Um, so that's kind of the question that I want to talk about. And really wormholes is just one application. Okay, so the, 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 the underlying question is basically the question of um, what kind of space times are physical. Okay, so what kind of space times can, can really exist? Um, and um, to clarify, uh, I'm, I want to think about this like in the semi-classical regime where we know what we mean by space-time and geometry. Uh, and I want, I want to talk about actual Lorentzian solutions. So some of the interesting wormholes recently have appeared in these calculations of the entanglement entropy for black holes. Um, th those are not necessarily like solutions in real physical space time. They're, they're very interesting things. It's, it's fabulous what's going on there. But the focus here is going to be on actual Lorentzian solutions. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. Um, and uh, basically, I want to tell you about, you know, the current status of this stuff, a couple of new results, and then some open questions. Um, yeah, so now the goal is for this to be kind of pedagogical and interactive um, and for you guys to ask questions. 
And I was told to prepare it at the level of master students and PhD students. But so I see ben, somebody... So you have mentioned about the other results. So other means the Euclidean stuff you are talking about. Uh, so, sorry? So you will talk about the Lorentzian solutions, but the yeah. other results you pointed, that one is the Euclidean solutions you are talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Or various, yeah, various saddle point solutions that show up in calculating things like uh, the entanglement entropy or the purity of a, of a state. Um, yeah, so, okay, so I was told to prepare this at the level of uh, masters and PhD students. Um, but yeah, the goal is for it to be kind of pedagogical and interactive. Um, and actually, so I know a few of these people that I see here, they're mostly neither masters students nor PhD students. But um, so I see a total of 21 people. So I think it's a reasonable size that you could actually introduce yourself and tell me, yeah, what, like what your current level is and what you're working on. So just two sentences. And then I'll know much better, um, you know, what's the right kind of level to discuss these things. I mean, obviously I prepared something, but things can be a bit adjusted. So um, would you mind introducing yourself very briefly? I think it will be worthwhile for the later discussion. Uh, hello, Ben, I'm Andrei Shu. And in fact, for me, any level is okay because I already did a lot of stuff with gravity and etc. So I'm just very interested to learn new things. And I guess being a professional as you are in wormholes would be kind of beneficial for me. Also, it would probably motivate me to do my own research, but whatever level you choose is fine for me. Thank you. Okay. Am I in charge here? So let's see. Uh, I see Boob Nash. Can you tell me who you Hello. are? Hi. Hello, sir. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I am actually a undergrad BSc uh, student um, uh, and don't have any, any advanced courses yet. So I'd like to get into, uh, into astrophysics. And I thought uh, this course might help me in uh, deciding my, um, you know, the research work that I might be doing in future. So I thought it may be a good idea to join you in this lecture. All right, cool. I will try to convert you. Um, Caroline, Caroline. I think we can hear you okay. We can hear you. So Caroline is a PhD student here at okay. Yeah. Good. Um, let's see. Ganesh, do we? Sorry, the names, the order keeps changing. So. Uh... Yeah, hello, sir. Actually, I am. Uh, I finished my master degree already. So working on for a PhD program. So basically I am interested in bouncing cosmology and <coughs> working mainly about the singularity in AD universe. All so, right. but I can manage uh, the maths actually. So no problem with it. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome. So I'm Hannes Rüter. Uh, I'm a postdoc and work on numerical simulations of black holes. Um, but yeah, I have no experience about wormholes whatsoever. All right. Nice to meet you. Um, we, all, we all know Shobi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been, so I'm Shovik. I, uh, I work in uh, DSCFT wormholes and stuff like that. And also inform information theory connection. Yes. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Bye. Um, yeah, I guess Ivan, I also know, but maybe you can still say hi. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you can start. So like, you, you, you have to approach some kind of 
minimalistic approach. All right, all right. Just, sorry, because Ben, you already know me. I'm Roberto. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a master student. Uh, just uh, wanted to let you know, I learned about this through students. I didn't know that it was uh, meant uh, for, uh, for masters. Uh, for must let me uh, i cannot turn on the video but uh well i hope that you don't mind that i'm around uh, I, i'm happy to have you I, I, well i think it's for all levels but i was told to kind of direct it at that level that's so. fine i wanted to know what your take on this is okay cool um does anyone else want to say hi who's out there uh hello uh, so i am adele uh, i have already a master degree in theoretical physics but now I'm working on a PhD in more applied physics about statistical physics and relaxation and diffusion phenomena. But I'm, I was always interested in these, let's say, more fundamental uh, works in, in theoretical physics. So, All right. Welcome. And then we heard from a couple of people in the chat. Um, so I won't read those out loud. Shovik really did, uh, had written a very big message. Yeah, yeah, but we can all see. So yeah, welcome to you guys. And then anyone else? Okay, good. So um, yes, yeah, so the, the goal is to tell you the current status, some, some recent things I've been working on and some, and some open questions. All right, and, um, and this is the basic question that we're gonna try to um, discuss. Um, so first of all, to talk very briefly about the, um, the classical situation. Um, so yeah, maybe some people need to go get a cup of coffee during this time. But um, so uh, everybody has been uh, reminded recently that we have this nice Penrose singularity theorem. And um, yeah, so an issue um, that, that that's fundamental to, to this question, um, both in the classical case and in the quantum case, is that um, any metric is, is okay in the sense that it solves Einstein's equations, right? Because given any metric, you can calculate the Einstein tensor, uh, and then you can write this equation, and it will correspond to some stress tensor, um, so if you think that some things are crazy and you want to rule out some metrics, um, then what you need is conditions on the stress tensor. All right, and that, that's going to be the main thing that we're going to, that we're going to talk about. Um, so in this Penrose case, um, the assumption of this theorem is the null energy condition. Um, and that condition is this one. So we take the stress tensor and we contract it with some, some null vector. Okay, so this k squared is equal to zero. Uh, we do this at any point in space. Uh, and the claim is that this thing should be positive or non-negative. So to think about it in, in kind of a, um, Intuitive way, if you have a perfect fluid kind of stress tensor, what this is telling you is that the energy density plus the pressure is not going to be negative. Um, so, you know, ordinary kind of stuff, it has a positive energy density and it also has a positive pressure. Uh, you can have some kind of objects like strings that have a positive energy density and negative pressure, um, but they will still satisfy this this uh, combined equation. Um, and then finally, you can have things that have a negative energy density, like a negative va vacuum energy. But those things will have positive pressure, and they will still satisfy this equation. Okay, so I, I think it's fair to say that all sensible classical theories satisfy this equation. So there's a lot of other energy conditions, the weak energy condition, the strong energy condition, the dominant energy condition, 
But I honestly don't know why people like them because they're easy to violate with sensible classical stuff. So this is kind of my favorite energy condition because at least classically, it seems to be a correct equation. Okay, so once you have that assumption, um, you make a couple of other uh, assumptions and this Penrose singularity th theorem tells you that if you have a trapped surface, Uh, on a Cauchy slice that's non-compact, and assuming this null energy condition, uh, then there has to be a singularity. And um, I would say the physical importance of this of this thing is, you know, we have the Schwarzschild solution, right? Everybody knows that. So that's a nice solution. But the question was, uh, was the singularity actually a robust prediction, right? And if you take some point inside the, uh, inside the horizon, uh, this is a trapped surface because light rays that you send forward in either direction will contract. Um, and the point of the singularity theorem is it tells you that the singularity is not an artifact of looking at this nice spherically symmetric solution. Anytime you have this kind of trapped surface, then you have to get a singularity. Okay, so there's basically there's very strict rules for classical um, GR. Um, and to kind of just give a little more intuition that will also generalize to the quantum case, um, the, this basic result, uh, it pretty much follows from the Ray Chaudhuri equation, right? So the Ray Chaudhuri equation tells you about the expansion of null geodesics. Um, And the Rechidori equation looks like this. So theta is the expansion of the null geodesics. And we take a derivative with respect to some affine parameter uh, along the, the null geodesics. Um, and we get some expansion like uh, a, a formula like this. We have some other terms, um, some shear terms and some vorticity terms which are not important once we have this, this um, closed trap surface. Or we could just say they're, they're zero in spherically symmetric situations. Uh, in, in general, they're just there. Um, and then we have exactly this um, contraction of the stress tensor with a null vector along the rays. Okay, so this is a null vector. So you can think of this equation as being an equation that's locally true uh, along some congruence of null geodesics. Okay, so you look at a null geodesic and some other null geodesics in its immediate neighborhood. Um, this theta is the change in, in the size, the change in the area that those null geodesics are taking up. So that's, that's the expansion. Uh, and basically what, so you see that the quantity appearing here is exactly the quantity that's bounded by the null energy condition. Okay, so what, what the null energy condition is telling you uh, is that matter focuses these things. So matter focuses null geodesic. Okay, that's, that's, the, um, that, that's the basic result. And that's because it's telling you that the expansion of those null geodesics, the time derivative of that, of that is some negative thing, which means focusing. Um, and so this immediately tells you that you can't have um, a traversable wormhole because, so let, let me maybe try to draw two different kinds of traversable wormholes. Right? My drawings are not really very good. So there's one type of traversable wormhole where we have two asymptotic regions of space-time connected by a wormhole. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Um, uh, what, uh, is there any expected size for the trap surfaces? Sorry? 
is there any expected size for the trap surfaces? Did you say an aspect of size? Expected size. I mean, uh, an expected size. Yeah. Is, is there any way to calculate it, or usually we take it the plan scale, right? Well, if you take the short shield black hole, you can take a like a sphere, a, a sphere just inside the horizon. So its size will be like the short shield radius, uh, and then that thing will be a trapped surface. Uh, are you asking whether you could consider smaller ones? Smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, right? Yeah. So you can consider a sphere that's just slightly smaller than the short shield radius. So that's just barely inside the horizon, and that will be a trapped surface. Okay. Um, so that would be the, like the most convenient one to think about. But uh, we don't know exactly what is the size size of it, right? Yeah. So like, if you're given one way of thinking about that theorem is that someone tells you some some part of the space time. Um, then if you can find a trapped surface in the part of the space time that they tell you, then you can say, okay, within classical GR, we're going to have a singularity in the future. Okay. Yeah, so if we have, um, if we try to make this kind of a wormhole, um, we can, so here I'm just drawing space. Okay, so now we can think about uh, some null geodesics and let's just make them spherically symmetric, right? This problem has spherical symmetry. So we can think about sending in some null geodesics that, that just travel through this wormhole. Okay, so we can think about, you know, light rays that go through and come out the other side. All right, and then we also have some, if I draw too many, it's gonna be a total mess, All right? And just by looking at these, you can see that, so this is basically the area that's showing up in this expansion, right? Uh, and you can see that the, so the area is decreasing as we go in here, and then it starts increasing again, right? So here, uh, at this point, we have theta less than zero because we have a contracting, the, because of the size of the sphere is getting smaller. And then here we have a place with theta greater than zero, right? In order for that to happen, you would need to have theta dot be positive somewhere. But this equation is telling you that as long as you satisfy the null energy condition, then theta dot will not be positive. Okay, so as long as, a, and you could say the same thing for a wormhole that connects two different regions in the same space time. Again, you need some null rays to defocus. Okay, so um, what Penrose is telling you is that uh, as long as you believe this null energy condition, then light rays can't make it through a wormhole. Okay, so, and let's define traversable to be a, a wormhole that light rays can make it through. And Penrose is telling you that that's not possible. Okay, so the, the, um, the Schwarzschild solution, in a sense that has a wormhole in it, right? Because if you, if you take the Schwarzschild solution then now let's take asymptotically flat space. If we look at it at this time, of course it's true that the geometry looks more or less like this, right? We have this Einstein-Rosen bridge, but this is not a traversable wormhole because light rays can't get from this asymptotic region to that asymptotic region. Okay, so that's the classical conclusion. No traversable wormholes. Um, Someone mentioned bouncing cosmologies, so let's also say that classically the conclusion is that you can't have, have bouncing cosmologies because of the same type of um, singularity theorems. Um, yeah, so I think the classical situation is very clear. Uh, are, are there any questions about that part? And then we then we come to the quantum, the quantum part.
Yeah, so let me just say like classically we, we do we, we do two things. So we can we can say that there's no traversable wormholes. And another thing we can do is um, we can show that once we have the Schwarzschild solution, that there will be a singularity. Okay, so there's kind of two things that we do with this. So we get no traversable wormholes. Uh, and then let's maybe erase this one because I don't want to focus on it. The second thing that that we get is that if we have a trapped surface, then we have to have a singularity. Okay, that's that's uh, classical. Uh, but of course, our world is not classical. So the question is. It's all very nice, you know, to give out Nobel prizes and stuff for nice classical results. But like, does it at all valid in the real quantum world? You know, should we expect that real black holes should obey these rules or not? So um, basically the question is, how do we generalize this analysis to semi-classical gravity? So, um, the most obvious thing that you might guess, so you remember we had the, this um, T mu nu, the stress tensor contracted with a null vector. Uh, and I'll just abbreviate this as T plus plus. And you can think of X plus as some light like coordinate. So uh, a thing that you might say is simply that the expectation value of this thing should be positive at every point. That, that would be kind of the obvious classical generalization of the uh, quantum generalization of this classical result. Um, but this is not true. Uh, this is violated, as far as I know, in every quantum field theory. Okay, so you can just take the state side, which is some normalization times the vacuum plus some two particle state. Um, and you can calculate the expectation value of the stress tensor and it'll be positive, the, the null parts of the stress tensor, and it'll be positive some places and negative in other places. Okay? So it is allowed to have negative energy. So let's, let's say negative null energy. So that is awkward. So we can't we can't really use these these theorems like before. Well, one thing I thought for a while is like, yeah, okay, it's possible to have negative null energy, but it's sort of quantum, uh, and you can't really make. Uh, a state that you can describe well in the semi-classical approximation um, where you violate the null energy condition. Uh, but that's not true. You, if you just have enough quantum fields around, you can easily make states um, where the semi-classical approximation is reliable and you violate the null energy condition. So, um, yeah, basically what, I'm, yeah. So once, once you can have negative energy, then the question is, um, are there any rules? Or can we just do every kind of crazy thing that we feel like once we have quantum mechanics? Um, and what I want to tell you is that um, there's some rules known. Or let's say suspected. Um, but there's a lot of open questions. Okay, so now we're going to get into some more details about like uh, what kind of uh, energy conditions are might be true in quantum field theory. Um, but are there questions about the basic setup or just comments?
Any question, guys? Please ask. I think you proceed, maybe they will ask later. Okay, we'll just interrupt uh, at any time with, with questions. All right, so uh, let me first list a few things that, well, we'll start with things that are known. So suppose we do quantum field theory uh, in Minkowski space time. Okay, so there's no gravity, there's no curved space. Um, then, as I said, you can violate the null energy condition at some place. Um, but what's true is the uh, average null energy condition, okay, that people call the ANEC. So what we do is we integrate over some null geodesic. Um, we integrate T plus plus. Uh, so let's, let's take x plus to be the coordinate along this, this null geodesic. Okay, so we're going to have x plus in this direction. Uh, and we integrate at uh, whatever value of the other coordinates we feel like. I'm sorry. So, okay, so we calculate the total uh, energy along this null geodesic. And that thing has to be positive. Uh, and that thing has been proven by Balakrishnan, Faulkner, Conker, and Vong. Um, So that, that's, that's a nice result that, that you can kind of count on. So the, the basic strategy you see is that like locally you can do whatever you want, you can make negative energy. But if you start integrating over some regions of space time, uh, then, then you can get some results. Um, okay, but we need a little bit more than results in, in Minkowski space time because we want to constrain different geometries. Uh, and, and we need to be able to say like, you know, so, so then in curved space, what, what can you have? Um, so suppose you do quantum field theory in curved space. Well, then actually you can show that this average null energy condition can't be, is not always true. Uh, one example is you can just consider space to be a cylinder, right? So we have time going this way, and then we have a compact spatial direction. You can consider an null geodesic that just circles around this cylinder. Uh, and if you integrate over that null geodesic, um, so this, depending on your theory, um, on the cylinder, you're going to have a negative Casimir energy, which is going to get, lead to a negative value of T plus plus, which is constant everywhere in space, right? This is a space time that has translation invariance. And so if you integrate over this yellow null ray that I drew, you just keep adding up negative stuff and you won't satisfy this, this condition. Okay, so the average null energy condition is violated. Um, there's a generalization of the average null energy condition that takes away uh, these types of null geodesics that wind around. Uh, and that's called the achronal average null energy condition. Okay. So basically, and th this is going to be kind of an important um, idea. So this um, yellow Ray, it is an all geodesic, but it's not achronal. And the reason that's, that it's not achronal is that we can connect two different points on it with a time like line. Okay, so the definition of achronal is that no two points can be connected in a time like way. So 
So by a time like that. Okay, so that, that's something that might be true in curved space, except actually there's, there's more complicated counterexample to this, to this thing that you get by basically taking some region with negative energy and then doing a conformal transformation so that that's all of space. So the thing that might be true uh, in general curved spaces, so this, this, is, this thing is proven. This is uh, something that might be true, which was suggested by Graham and Olo. Um, and this thing is called the self-consistent achronal average null energy condition. I don't think they ever wrote this terrible acronym. And the self-consistent part means that the space time you're considering, it shouldn't just be any old curved space that you feel like writing down. It should solve the Einstein equations with your stress tensor that you're discussing. Okay? So that, that is kind of the, the physical situation that, that we're typically interested in, right? We, we care about these energy conditions but we, because we care about how they back react on the geometry. Um, and so what this is telling you what, what this is claiming, and there are no counterexamples as far as I'm aware, is that if you have some space time that satisfies the Einstein equations, um, then um, this integral here um, uh, along an old geodesic should be positive. Is it clear? Because we're, now we're going to kind of use this. So I'm, I'm not going to explain more why this might be true. But I'm going to tell you about like what consequences it has. All right. So let's let's play the game where we assume this energy condition. Uh, and we ask about the consequences. So, um, yeah, I want to come to, back to the theme, which is wormholes. All right, so suppose that you have um, some wormholes that connect two regions in space here. All right, let me maybe ask you a question since people have been rather quiet. So, all right, here we go. So we have some wormholes connecting two different so these, these wormholes are part of the same asymptotic space. So basically, uh, if you want to get, I don't know if my picture is very good, but so if you want to get from here over to here, or to be more specific, let's say if you want to get light from there from one way to the other, there's two different ways that light can go. So one way it can go is through the wormhole. Uh, and the other way that it can go is it can go just around in the space time outside the wormhole. Okay, those are both allowed paths um, that light can take. All right, question is, um, is this geometry consistent with the thing that we believe might be true, which is the self-consistent achronal average null energy condition? Maybe I should tell you one more, one more piece of information, which is, you remember we had this ray Chaudhuri equation, right? So basically by integrating the ray Chaudhuri equation, uh, 
Um, what you find uh, is that, you know, if you integrate over this thing, you get some total amount of, of defocusing, right? So the total change in the expansion uh, is given by this integral of exactly this quantity of t plus plus. Uh, with a minus sign. So you remember there's a minus sign in the right Shiduri equation. <clears throat> or really there's the other negative terms. Um, so what I should really say is that the change in the expansion uh, is less than a certain negative number, which is the integral of the null energy along that geodesic. Okay? So now if we have some null geodesics going through here, we can think about applying this kind of condition. Okay, so what, what are your opinions? Is this, is this kind of traversable wormhole? So again, uh, here you integrating with respect to time or what? Sorry, in this integral? Yes. Yeah, so really you should have some affine parameter along this null geodesic. Uh, let me just call it x plus for now. Or yeah, let's maybe call it uh, let's maybe call it um, lambda. Yeah, why I'm asking because in Rajodhari equation there is a uh, d theta d something square. Okay, so yeah. that parameter has to be there. So probably this is coming from there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so this lambda should be some should be the affine parameter. Uh, along this geodesic. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay, what's your opinion? Uh, is this is this equation? Um, yeah, sorry. So so the change in the uh, expansion uh, is is bounded through the ratio Dury equation by this integral of the stress tensor. Um, and then we can use this um, self-consistent acronal ANAC to say that the if we integrate this thing over an acronal null geodesic, then the change um, then the change in the expansion um, should be negative. along any acronal null geodesic. Okay, so that, that's what this thing is telling us. Then the question is, does this space-time satisfy that condition or no? I'm not answering this question, but some, someone is gonna have to uh, give their opinion. Opinion, guys, to help Ben. I don't know. Everybody is silent. <laughs> well, that's fine. I, I can wait. But I mean, it's too long of a time slot for me to just talk. So. So first, this space-time should satisfy, you said, the Einstein equations, right? Yes. Like and then you have also these special acronal null geodesics. Yes. Hmm. Well, maybe I should ask an intermediate question first. So do you see any null geodesics where from one end to the other, their change in expansion uh, is positive. Well, 
and maybe from outside. <laughs> So these, these green ones? Yeah. Or the, yeah, this green one, it's a little bit hard to tell, right? Because I wasn't very specific about what it did. So I said it went from this point to this point and then back out to infinity. Um, but I'm not sure I really know something about the expansion. Um, but how about the, the pink guy? This, this um, geodesic here. So if we go from one side to the other, um, does that thing like focus or defocus? It seems that it is. It focuses and then it defocuses. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, because we can think about one nearby, you know, which kind of gets closer as it goes in here, and then it expands out again. Okay, good. So along this, um, thank you for your assistance. Um, so what, what you see is that this thing is focusing and then it's defocusing. So if you travel the, along this whole pink geodesic, then um, the change in the expansion has to be positive. Okay, so that's kind of the property of these wormholes, right? They're, they're, because they have these two mouths, you have to defocus stuff through the wormhole. Could it be also zero? Yeah, for that we maybe need to look more closely, but it can't be zero because, you know, like near here, you're like approaching the mouth of the black hole and things are converging, right? So for that, I would need to write more equations. So you kind of have to trust me a bit, but we can choose some geodesic where things are, if we just use the spherical symmetry, things will be converging here. And then when you come out the other mouth, then they'll be diverging because it'll be like the time reverse. Okay, so basically like if we, if we travel along here, then we have some converging geodesics. So in particular, we have a negative theta and then when we keep traveling along and we come out here, then we have diverging. Um, and so here we have theta being positive. So somewhere in the middle there, some magic needs to happen. And um, theta needs to go from, the expansion needs to go from negative to positive. Um, so in order to have this kind of thing, then we need to have some defocusing in here. And really even over this whole kind of thing. So good, but um, I don't think we still quite answered the question yet, which is, um, is this okay to have this defocusing? Have we violated the self-consistent achronal average null energy condition? by proposing this geometry. Normally, yes. Normally, we violated this uh, self-consistent acronym on geodesics because it is supposed, if I understood well, it is supposed that the delta theta is always inferior to zero, if I understood well. So normally it violated. Yes. Well, it looks like it's violating it, but there's um, one of these many adjectives that will potentially allow us to escape, escape from the conclusion that we're violating this self-consistent achronal average null energy condition for certain kinds of wormholes. Now, I'm pretty sure someone is going to tell me the answer. So let me summarize what we concluded here, because I didn't, of course, give you all the equations that you need. Okay, what I can tell you is, along this pink geodesic, the achronal uh, the average null energy condition is violated. Okay. 
Okay, so that's that's a true statement. So how can we still be consistent with this this um, idea? Can you remind the acronal uh, condition, like to be acronal? Yes, I appreciate it, Lorenzo. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that. So exactly, that it's this extra a that's that's um, that's going to save us. So it's okay to violate this thing um, as long as this um, pink geodesic uh, is not acronal. And not a chronal means chronal. Okay? And what chronal means, yeah, as you said, um, I should remind you so, uh, chronal means that two points on this null geodesic um, can be connected um, by a time like path. And so you see that depends on the detail. So that's why I drew these two geodesics here, okay? Let's say it's true. So it depends on whether this wormhole is a shortcut. So you can imagine sitting at this point and shining one laser through the wormhole and one laser outside here, okay? And you have your friend over here. The question is, so you send a laser pulse in both directions, the red one and the green one, okay? Suppose that this person gets the um, green pulse first. That tells you that there's a faster path outside than inside, okay? And that tells you that, in fact, you can connect the place where this time, so that means that this pink thing going through here uh, is slower than the green thing. And that means that actually you could connect this point and this point where this pink um, laser comes out uh, with a time-like path, right? Because this, this green path, the light beat it, so now you can just go a little bit slower uh, and you can connect um, and you can actually get there in time to catch this red laser as it comes out of the other side, okay? So the um, so the conclusion is that um, if this, yeah, I guess we'll call them this pink. So if this pink path is slower than some path outside, so the green one is any path that doesn't go through the wormhole, Uh, in the sense that light takes longer to get to this point over here along the pink path than along the green path. Um, then that tells us that this pink geodesic is chronal. Uh, and then we're allowed to violate the average null energy condition. Okay, so th this is the first thing which, uh, I mean, um, it, it's not proven, but it seems to be a rule about, about these wormholes. Um, so we have, we have like a proposed rule. which is that shortcut wormholes ones which allow you to send a signal faster than in the ambient space time are, are relegated to science fiction
and non-shortcut wormholes. I'm not sure what we call those exactly. They can exist. Okay, so that, that rule follows from this thing we believe to be true, this self-consistent aquinal average null energy condition. And one reason that we kind of believe this rule as well is that there have been these explicit constructions of, of wormholes of this nature, right? There's this construction of Maldesena, Milek, and, and Popoff. Uh, and they constructed, you know, using magnetically charged black holes and charged fermions, they constructed a solution like this. Uh, and then by analyzing, you know, the stress tensor that was supporting their solution, they found also that their, that their wormhole was not uh, a shortcut. Okay, so the, the, the point of view of these kind of conditions, it, it, the point of those things is for, to kind of tell you something in general, okay? If you're energetic enough to really explicitly construct something in quantum field theory plus gravity, you can just construct it and you don't need these general rules, okay? But it's kind of nice to have these general rules. Also, if you're lazy, then you don't need to go through this whole construction. You can just say, okay, these are types of wormholes that might exist in real life. Another good thing about this conclusion, actually, is that there's these arguments that they're a little bit elaborate, um, but there's arguments that if you would have a shortcut wormhole, then you could use that to make a time machine to go back in time. Um, and that would seem to be not consistent with causality. Okay, so also from that point of view, it seems good that the condition we believe is true about quantum field theory uh, is telling us that our wormholes should not be shortcuts. Now, th these wormholes are not supposed to be shortcuts in, in the sense that light rays going through the wormhole take longer than light rays staying outside. Um, they can actually still be shortcuts. So there is a recent paper by Maldesena and Milekin called Humanly Traversable Wormholes. Um, and there they argue that it can be the case that in terms of the proper time it takes you to go through, um, that in fact these wormholes might be useful. So it can take a, you know, a small amount of proper time to go through, uh, and it could be a useful way to get to a distant galaxy. I think it's not exactly a practical idea yet. Um, but the, the important definition of shortcut from the point of view of Causality is this one about which way it takes light longer to go through. Um, and it seems to be the case that with that definition that these shortcut wormholes um, are not allowed. Did they discuss any method to actually have this? Like, like some weird matter to actually create something like that? So, um, there's two different papers from the last year by Maldesena Milekin, uh, one of them with Popoff. In the first one, they, they constructed this kind of solution uh, and they constructed it just using like the standard model. Um, they had to assume that the standard model was correct up to high energies where we don't know whether it's correct, but not, not like up to the Planck scale. Um, and they constructed this solution. Okay, so this traversable wormhole now exists as a solution of like the most vanilla thing you could imagine, which is the standard model plus GR. Okay. Th they didn't answer the question of like, uh, how would you create those things? Or do they exist in real life? And I think there's not a um, convincing story that says that we should expect to find those things out there. Um, but it is like a self-consistent solution. Uh, and then in this recent one, they considered a slightly different, uh, instead of assuming that we had the standard model, um, they had um, more one of these Randall syndrome type uh, scenarios. So that, that means like there's some, some other new physics, some other beyond the standard model physics. Uh, and then they could construct kind of more robust versions of these. 
things. But yeah, the, the existence of those solutions seems to be pretty robust, actually. Maybe I can add one thing. I mean, I think that the existence of the solutions is robust, but the solutions themselves, uh, themselves are uh, fairly fragile. Yeah. So that they can be, well, they can live for so long, uh, but uh, it's very easy to destabilize them in general. There's many mechanisms for uh, destabilizing them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, it, it seems like it, it almost might be a, a, a generic thing that when you make these wormholes, and uh, like one, I think the most interesting kind of instability is you try to send something through uh, and then the back reaction of that stuff makes the wormhole not traversable anymore. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah I think that's right. I mean, you can have say non-zero measure uh, perturbations that uh, don't uh, destroy the, the wormhole, but uh, in any realistic situation, I mean, if you embed this in the standard model, it's, uh, it's very limited what you can do, what you can send uh, across the wormhole. It has to be small and light. Yeah, well, I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, the, is there, but I haven't thought about it in enough detail, like, is there some kind of, um, you know, is there like a, a bound on the amount of information that can be sent through? Or yeah, I think so, yeah. Or, or what? Yeah, 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 the, there's, there's such a thing. I, I, I don't think I can, I can reproduce you. I can reproduce now the, the bound uh, of the top of my head, but uh, there is, there are such bounds. Uh -huh. Which you can also infer from the, dual of this, uh, the, well, the expected holographic dual of these, of these wormholes. Yeah, so I'll maybe talk about the holographic thing in a moment. So this was a flat space that, so yeah, I'm aware of some situations where there's a bound on um, the amount of information, for example, on this um, gouge out first wall wormhole. Yeah, so okay, maybe I should say more but, gently. So this is a fun one and I focused on it because it's a solution of the standard model. Uh, but there have been a number of, uh, of constructions recently of traversable wormholes. And, and the, the first one, which convinced me that this was not science fiction, was its construction of Gal, Jaffers, and Wall uh, in, in ADS CFT. Um, and yeah, in that one, I'm aware of some bounds on, on how much information can be sent through and, and what the dual is. Um, and I'll come to a, a, a new one that we're constructing in ADS. Um, but yeah, in this particular example, I suppose there should be some bound, but, I, but there you're an asymptotically flat space and I don't know what, what it would be. Well, there's a very generic bound that you can find. So there's a binding energy for the, for the wormhole. Mm -hmm. And then anything that you send in, the energy that it has, it cannot exceed this, uh, this bound, right? Yes. Because otherwise you, you destroy the defocusing. Yeah. If yeah. you put in too much energy. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, so th this was sort of, um, yeah, so let's see. Is it sensible to take like a five minute break before we continue? I mean, I, I don't, um, have anything I need to do, but I, I think it's nice if people can recover for a moment. Yeah, take five minutes break. Okay. okay. If people have things they want to chat about, then uh, go ahead. We can add one thing. You mentioned yeah. time machines. The time yeah. machine that uh, in principle you shouldn't be allowed to turn a wormhole into a time machine. And I agree with that, uh, with that uh, conclusion. But that's something that follows from a very generic argument. This doesn't tell you 
if you start with a wormhole and then you try to turn it into a time machine through any of the mechanisms that uh, people have uh, thought about, bringing in, say, something very massive to close to one of the mouths or taking the one of the mouths in a, a yeah. twin paradox uh, trip. That argument doesn't tell you what happens, how, the, how you fail to turn this into a time machine. And that's uh, something that I uh, work with my student, Maria. We've uh, studied and, uh, well, we hope or expect to write a paper on that, uh, that room. It's a bit like, uh, you know, that uh, well, relativity, in special relativity, there's a, well, you cannot uh, have something traveling faster than the speed of light, but this doesn't tell you what happens. The general principle doesn't tell you what happens if you actually try to do it. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I mean, um, yeah, I'd be interested to see what you guys say, because it, it's true, like the, the, say you have some shortcut wormhole, uh, as you say, the steps of turning it into a time machine are kind of elaborate, right? Like you, yeah. you, you arrange for some large gravitational redshift, or you have to do but, pretty crazy stuff. And then maybe that will break the wormhole. No, okay. But even, even if you have a, a wormhole that's not a shortcut uh, wormhole, mm -hmm. if you do things uh, say naively, and then you try to turn, you could think of uh, trying to turn this into a time machine, even if it's a, a one hole that's longer through the interior than, uh, than through the exterior. Really? Yeah, uh, you can, well, in principle, I mean, if you, so let me uh, disclose things. It's, uh, if you don't take into account the uh, back reaction properly, mm -hmm. uh, then say that uh, you bring close to one of the mouths, you bring, say, uh, another black hole, something, a uh, garden yeah. or something, and then you let it be there for long enough. Mm -hmm. Then no matter how long the tube, the throat is, at some point, the time delay that you're going to build uh, by having this uh, a very massive object close to one of the mouths, you're going to keep increasing this time delay between the two mouths arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, it's going to be long enough that uh, you're going to have a, a time machine. That's if you, as I say, if you don't take into account the back reaction from the, the back reaction of uh, what well, that this has on the, on the tube. Uh, hi, Roberto. Can I comment on what you said now? Okay. So there was a quite a long story related to conversion of wormholes to time machines originated yes. with work by Kip Thorne and his collaborators. And so, of course, like two possibilities, like you mentioned, either is moving one mouse or putting uh, gravitational potential yes. that was done by Frolov later. And yes. eventually, uh, Stephen Hawking objected this all by posting his chronology protection. Yes. Conjecture. It was 1991, I guess, uh, article in PRD. I know. Yeah. But my whole the major discussion between Turner and Hawking was uh, what time cutoff to take and what exactly time to choose to make yeah. the cutoff because the Hawking was arguing that time should be calculated with respect to the local observer as far as I remember. Yeah. So now coming back to what you said, like naively, like if you start with completely clean wormhole solution in the sense like you have absolutely nothing in the space time, just the wormhole and the mouse are kept uh, at rest with respect to each other. So that means you have not converted a time machine yet. Yes. So now taking any tiny perturbation like what you discussed now, if I understood it properly, will eventually make it to at some scale the time machine working. And then all the consequences that were discussed by Torn and calculated by Kim, like his postdoc and Hawking arguments will immediately come up. Yeah, but let me know. The, the, so what they objected is that uh, eventually at uh, when you're about to create a time machine that uh, what they say is that uh, quantum, well, the, there would be a divergence in the stress and tensor of uh, quantum fields near this uh, chronology horizon. And then this, uh, well, there should be some strong back reaction, probably at the uh, Planck scale or something that would destroy the, your right. attempt. Of, uh, what I'm saying is that way before this happens, you're going to fail to create a time machine. So what I'm saying is that the arguments that they gave, they might be right if you didn't, uh, they might be right 
if back reaction effects weren't important until the last moment. What I'm telling you is that, uh, what, I'm trying to tell you, what, what we're arguing is that way before you get to that point, the back reaction, at, almost at the initial time, is going to make your uh, wormhole uh, impossible to, to turn into a time machine. So the, what they were saying is that essentially Planck scale gravity effects would prevent you that appear when you're about to create the time machine. What they were saying is that uh, these effects would prevent the, the creation of the time machine. That chronology protection is implemented by, say, some quantum gravity effects. What I'm saying is that chronology protection in this case is uh, implemented by low energy physics. You don't need to invoke any diverging back reaction of quantum fields. It happens already at a level of a very weak back reaction. So do you mean that you do it purely in classical physics result? No, quantum, but uh, not Planckian. Oh, okay. So this is that your recent work is about? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's a work that, uh, well, we hope to, to post uh, not too late. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. Looking forward to see it. Thank you. But uh, then, well, I guess I suppose we should continue, but maybe to wrap up this, this interesting discussion though. Um, so are you saying then that perhaps, perhaps we don't actually need this, this principle, that something else will stop you from building a... Yeah, that's right. So I can't, I can't get around, if, if I assume that I have even like crazy kinds of energy I violate every energy condition I feel like I still won't be able to build a time machine. Well, I don't know how crazy, but uh, the argument would work even if you didn't have the protection from uh, AA neck. I see, I see. Okay, that, that would be fun to uh, look into some more. Um, I see, and the, and the type of thing that you're trying to rule out is that like you initially have no time machine and then at some time you create a time machine. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I guess I can just write down a, a space time with closed time like curves, but that, that's maybe not the... Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can do that or you can have, you can write a, a space time. This is what uh, was done in the old works that uh, Andre yeah. was mentioning of uh, Hawking, Thorne and the others, where you have a space time that at some point develops time machines and then you study quantum field theory in these space times without back reacting the, but then you see that the quantum fields uh, develop a divergence uh, close to the chronology, chronology horizon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, thanks for all the interesting comments. So I guess we'll go, go forward a bit more. Are there other questions or comments? So I thought it'd be nice to talk about a concrete uh, example. And, and I picked this one just because it's the one that I'm working on. So all of these different kind of wormholes are interesting. Um, so I, I decided to talk about the traversable wormholes in ADS. Okay, and um, yeah, basically we just wanna take this solution that uh, Maldesena and friends constructed and put it in asymptotically ADS. Um, yeah, it's sort of that. It's just like a nice master's project. And, um, but I think the results are kind of nice and it gets like sort of a nice illustration compared to all of these general principles. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, I don't know if Subic is still here, but I, I think he also figured out some similar, yeah, yeah, some similar kind of solutions. So, um, good. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to uh, basically make a version of that traversable wormhole, but now uh, in ADS spacetime, where we'll have a nice dual for it. Uh, and then, yeah, maybe this will be also useful to um, Roberto and collaborators and the, the more elaborate things that they're, that they're doing. Um, so what, what are our ingredients here? Um, we have some massless charged fermions. in the bulk um, that we'll call psi. Uh, we consider some near extremal magnetically charged black holes. Uh, 
Um, good. And then, and then we, the, the last thing that we need uh, along the lines of these recent things, so the sort of exotic thing that we need that's going to allow us to violate um, like the average null energy condition uh, is we need a coupling between the two boundaries. And this is the sort of um, new ingredient that was introduced in this Galdreff first wall paper. Okay. Um, so we're going to have, in, in terms of the, the dual CFTs, we're going to have a, 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 an extra term in the action, um, which is going to be, and for, for um, we'll be in bulk ADS4. Um, so the boundary is going to be a 3D CFT. Uh, and we're going to couple the dual operator to these fermions, which I'm also going to call psi, um, between the left side and, and, and the right side. Okay, so there's two ways you could think about it, but the most convenient is to think about that this is a solution with two boundaries, and each boundary has two CFTs. Um, and, sorry. And we couple the operators in those two CFTs. Okay, and these psi plus psi, mi psi minus are just the usual like chiral components of the of the field. So that that's the exotic thing that we have. And so what you should kind of think is that you have the two ADS boundaries. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce a, co a coordinate row, which goes to infinity uh, at both of these boundaries. Well, I guess it goes to minus infinity at this boundary. Uh, and what this is telling you is that when you have a fermion approaching the boundary, uh, sorry, and I should say there's going to be a parameter in front of this, uh, in front of this coupling that I'm going to call H. When you have a fermion approaching this boundary, if this coupling is small, it will mostly just bounce off the boundary, but a little piece of it will come over to the other boundary and come out. Okay, so um, it's kind of like fermions can travel from one side to the other side. So it's a little like, you know, Pac-Man. If you go out this side, you can come back in the other side, but only with a small probability uh, of order H. Okay, so that's that's the... That's the novel ingredient. Um, and then, uh, obviously, I'm not going to tell you most of the details, but to, to, I do want to be like a little bit concrete about how this, how this construction works. OK? So um, we, have, we have a metric, uh, which we can choose to put in this gauge, um, which turns out to be kind of convenient. So it has spherical symmetry, uh, and it's a it's a static solution. Okay, and now we just look for um, a solution where this f as a function of rho just looks like this. Okay, so overall here, far away from the black hole, we're just going to have some like rise or north from ADS. Uh, also over here. Uh, and then in this interior, we're going to have roughly some ADS2 cross S2. Now, the conceptual thing that's a little bit fun about trying to find this solution uh, is that you're trying to solve Einstein's equations, right? Uh, and so on the right side, you need to put the stress tensor. Uh, and in order to put the stress tensor, um, we're counting on these these quantum fields here, right? But normally to calculate the stress tensor for the quantum fields, you need to first know the geometry, right? So we have a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem, which is how can we figure out what the stress tensor is before we've solved the Einstein equations? And the convenient thing is that our ingredients that we have here are very simple due to some conformal invariance. Uh, and so I'm gonna write down actually what the stress, the different contributions to the stress tensor. Okay, um, because that's kind of the key simplification that we have. Um, so I'm going to write down the stress tensor. 
um, with upper and lower indices. So we have a piece of the stress tensor that's just due to the magnetic charge, okay, just due to the gauge field in the bulk. Um, and that thing, even before we solve for this F, so I guess the point is, just by using the symmetries that we assume, we can put the metric in this form, and then the unknown part of the metric is this, is this function F. Um, good. And this, um, the stress tensor due to the electromagnetic field um, takes this kind of form. Okay, so these are the directions on the sphere, and these are directions in the, the rho and t directions. Uh, and then you have the cosmological constant that I won't bother writing down. Uh, and then the last thing is these charged fermions. And, and those are kind of the key thing that are supposed to violate the null energy condition and so on. Okay, uh, and those are going to look like this. Um, so they're also going to depend on the charge of the black hole. They're going to depend, obviously, on this coupling that we added, um, because that, that's what creates this kind of Casimir-type energy. Um, they're going to depend on these parameters in the metric like this. Uh, and then they're going to have one parameter here, delta, which is basically the total width of this geometry. Okay? Uh, and then they're going to also have this traceless kind of form. So this is kind of the key thing that makes it possible to find these solutions explicitly, is that you can actually solve for what this stress tensor is for this quantum field. And that's only possible because you have all this nice conformal symmetry going on. Let, let me maybe write down this, this uh, delta just to be sort of complete about this thing. And this, this is the most detail that I'm going to go into. So this delta is um, like, the, it's kind of like the conformal uh, size of this whole geometry. Okay, so this, this guy here uh, is the one that that violates the null energy condition uh, for some sign of H. Okay, so we, we, we get that by doing like quantum field theory in curved space time and then using some, uh, using some approximations. So, so normally, in fact, like the, the stress tensor at some place, it would depend even like non-locally on the metric. So that's why it's very nice that this, this thing just depends on the metric in this, in this simple way. And now once you have that simple formula for the stress tensor, then you can go back in and solve the Einstein equations, and then it's not very complicated. So basically what happens is that when you go far away from this throat, then you can forget about this extra term here because this F becomes large. Okay, you just have your usual rise to north from ADS solution. Uh, and then in the, in the, the tricky thing is in the place where, where you have the throw, um, then this thing will dominate. Um, but in that, in that throw, it, it is very similar to the thing that was already done in these, in these Montesano papers. So- um, Sorry, Ben, uh, can yeah. I ask you something? So this, uh, this modifies both ADS2 and S2 part, or like um, in, the, in the normal case of dilaton uh, fluctuations or Jackie Teichelboim, you can order by order choose, like whether these uh, fluctuations away from ADS2 cross S2, whether uh, this will be on S2 or this will be on ADS2, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what kind of fluctuations you have from ADS2 cross S2? Well, yeah, so in this regime, you can do some perturbative thing as they also did in those papers. And so, um, we pretty much fixed the whole gauge when we decided that the metric had this form. Mm -hmm. um, and so both this, this function uh, and this function will, so there'll be two small perturbations. Uh -huh. um, so in this gauge, both like the, you would probably call this the ADS2 part, that thing gets modified as well as the- Okay, as well as that's what I was asking. Yeah, but um, you could probably also pick a different gauge uh, if you wanted to. Thanks. Um, good. So, 
then, okay, there's all kinds of details which are not uh, all that fun to follow. But maybe the fun thing to calculate in the end is this thing that's kind of like the binding energy. Okay, so you can calculate the asymptotic mass of this solution uh, in terms of the charge. Okay, so, um, but it's a little more convenient in terms of writing to relate it to this thing R bar, which is the, the size of the extremal black hole. Okay, so given some Q, then you have R bar, which is the um, horizon size, the size of S2, for the extremal black hole with that charge. All right, so that's a well-defined thing. And there's some relationship between Q and R bar, um, which is like G times Q um, up to some order one factors, uh, which looks something like this. Okay, so you can just go back and forth if you know the ADS radius between the charge uh, and this R bar. Uh, and now the fun thing to calculate is the mass of the wormhole. Um, so this wormhole, well, sorry, maybe I should say before, before finding the mass, the, the most fun thing is just that this solution exists, okay? So what is this solution? Um, it's static, it's spherically symmetric, and it has no singularities. Okay, so this is, a, this is some static, spherically symmetric, uh, and it's a solution which, with, um, with two ADS boundaries. And, and there's, a, there's a unique solution uh, once you fix that it should be static and, and spherically symmetric. Okay? So there's kind of like a unique ground state, at least from the point of view of doing uh, semi-classical GR. Okay, and you can calculate uh, kind of like the binding energy. So you can calculate the asymptotic mass of this thing. Um, so it's equal to this extremal mass, right, which is the, you know, the mass of the extremal black hole with that charge Q. Uh, and then minus a correction term. Uh, and the correction term uh, looks like this. So it depends on this, this parameter, H, that couple the two boundaries. Okay, so it looks like that. So what that means is that uh, if you look at this from far away, it looks like a rise from north from black hole, but with a mass that's below the extremal mass. Okay, so what it looks like from far away is it looks like a super extremal rise from north from ADS black hole. If you try to just find that solution just in GR, then you would find that it has like a, a naked singularity. And so you would discard it. But what happens here is, as you go farther in, this, um, this matter that's violating the null energy condition, uh, it modifies the solution into this non-singular ADS2 plus S2. And then you go through the, um, through the wormhole and out into the other ADS space. So I can maybe draw the conformal diagram, but I mean, it's sort of boring. We have, we have one boundary where R equals infinity. We have the other boundary where R equals infinity. And then we have the wormhole in between. So um, it's not kind of very exciting, actually, to draw the, to draw the picture. Um, but it's maybe good to keep in mind that you know, what, what, a co what caused this solution to exist is this coupling between these two, these two boundaries that we turned on. Okay, questions about this solution? Okay, so what, why not? So that, that's the solution and um, Oh, 
Oh yeah, and I should maybe uh, mention my collaborators in this thing. Um, so this this was done in, in collaboration with um, a, a master student, Susanna, uh, and a couple of PhD students, um, Dora and Ricardo. And uh, hopefully this will this will appear relatively soon. Um, one thing that I think we haven't fully resolved, we have some ideas, but I don't want to go into all the details right now, is like, th this is a self-consistent solution, and it was kind of fun to find it. Um, I think it's not totally clear what it's good for, right? It's, it's kind of nice to know what kind of wormholes you can construct, uh, but from the point of view of ADS-CFT, uh, it would be interesting if this solution would like dominate some ensemble or if it would be some ground state of uh, an interesting Hamiltonian that you care about. Uh, and that part we haven't, we haven't fully um, finished thinking about yet. Okay, so I think actually with many of these wormhole solutions, like even with this multi standard one, which is a solution in, uh, in the standard model, um, yeah, we don't know yet what they're good for. I mean, they're, from the point of view of this talk, we wanna know what kind of solutions are allowed to exist. Um, but from some other point of view, we might like to know um, whether these things actually exist in real life. Are they the ground, you know, does the system actually approach that state or not? Okay. That's kind of what I wanted to say about that part. Uh, and then in the, in the last few minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, more local energy conditions, right? If you notice... Can I, can I ask one question? Yes. It's not to advance, but what would be the uh, quantum field theory, let's say in super young Mills uh, theory, say that, uh, I mean, you're constructing this uh, in, in ADS-5, so then you have a uh, Super Young Mills uh, theory in, in a sphere, say. Yeah, but well, we're uh, in four actually. Yeah, or one. Sure yeah. Is, but... So then, what kind of configuration of the gauge theory would this uh, one hole be? Yeah, well, so the the, um, the idea was that the the wormhole was going to be roughly in like a, a thermal field double. Uh, sorry, that the gauge theory would be in a thermal field double type state. Yeah. Uh, maybe your question is illustrating that that um, I should have said something a little more. So the, the uh, maybe a more elegant way of stating what the the question is. Okay, here's a bulk solution. What is the dual of that solution? Like, what is the the CFT state? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and our idea was that it would be like um, a thermal field double type state. Okay. Um, uh... But then with an additional chemical potential turned on. Um, so I think what's true is that. I think that this this um, con this bulk configuration, uh, I think it's the ground state of a Hamiltonian, where we have like uh, the usual Hamiltonians at the left and the right theory. We have this coupling term. I'm gonna write it just schematically, uh, and then we have some chemical potential terms, something like that. And I think the ground state of that Hamiltonian. Uh, is this thing. And then I think probably from the CFT point of view, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is a thermal field double type configuration with this additional like chem chemical potential. But then what, what, what if you had both mouths in the same uh, CFT? I mean, instead of uh, having two separate uh, yeah. CFTs connected by some uh, perturbations you had, I think that uh, that, uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that, but see, this is kind of simple because it's like uh, spherically symmetric, so it's like spatially uniform in each CFT. Yeah. And they have more symmetries. And then uh, probably you could also do the thing like you said, um, where you have like a, a single CFT with two mouths, but then you're, you're doing something more complicated from the CFT point of view. And I haven't yeah. thought too much about that. Okay. Yeah, but that would be fun. Other questions or comments? Okay, so 
so, so let me tell you like in a little more schematic way about things that we're trying to think about, which is like more local energy conditions. Because if you notice that this energy condition that I told you, this, um, I mean, it has a lot of uh, adjectives, right? Uh, like you can barely, you can't even apply it if you have, um, unless you have an acronal curve and then you have to integrate to infinity. It's very inconvenient. So, because you'd like to have something that kind of tells you locally how much negative energy you're allowed to have, or at least somewhat locally, right? We're kind of used to like, if you try to zoom in on very small distance scales in quantum field theory, you get huge fluctuations. But we'd like to have kind of like a semi-local condition. You know, if you, if you average over some distance, then uh, how much negative energy can you have in that region? Okay, and I wanna kind of mention some things we proposed and some things that we're thinking about. So first of all, let's mention some inspiration um, from some true formulas. Uh, and, and for the same reason as before, I still want to focus on the, on the null energy for the most part. Um, okay, so one inspiration is that if you have 2D CFT, uh, then if you integrate over some region, so you integrate dx plus from zero to delta, so you, you average the energy along some piece of a null geodesic, um, then this is bigger than a certain negative number. So it's sort of like an uncertainty kind of principle thing. Uh, a, a nice uh, example um, to get some intuition actually is if you do 4D free fields. Uh, and now for a moment, we think about the ordinary energy density, which is a little bit more intuitive than the, this null thing. Um, so suppose you integrate from zero up to tau um, of t zero zero, so you integrate along some null ray. Um, so suppose you you do that kind of averaging. Uh, so then this was shown by Ford that this is larger than some number divided by this tau to the fourth. So you see, it's kind of an uncertainty principle type thing. If you average the amount of energy over some amount of time tau, then you, the energy is allowed to be negative, but only by some amount that depends on tau. So it's kind of like an energy time uncertainty principle. And that's a similar thing that you see in the null case uh, for 2D CFTs. So basically what we wanted to have is we wanted to extend this null case to higher dimensions. Because, I mean, that's what we need. Because if you think about, you know, even in real life, we have like asymptotically to center space. I don't know, we don't know that much about the asymptotics of our universe. But if we want to rule certain geometries in or out, we don't want to have to rely on these geodesics that go all the way to infinity. We want to be able to say something local. Right, so the question is, what can we say in higher dimensions? Um, and actually, so the main thing that you should take away from this talk uh, is that, uh, number one, I, I, this is an interesting question, and number two, we know almost nothing about higher dimensions. So if you want to propose energy conditions, derive new energy conditions, this is a, there's, there's a lot that you could potentially do. Um, actually, even in the 2D case, uh, in 2D curved space, in general curved spaces, I think nobody has proved the, the analog of this, of this thing. I think it has to pretty much work in the same way. Um, but as far as I can tell, that hasn't really been proven in general. Um, okay, so what, what, what I've proposed um, in a paper with um, Dimitrios um, is the smeared null energy condition. Uh, and what we proposed is basically an analog of this thing. So we've, we've first proposed something in gravity. Um, so let's, let's integrate along some piece of a null ray. Some amount of affine parameter. Let's maybe use lambda.
Okay, so like the average null energy over some region. Uh, and what we propose is that this should be larger than some order of one number divided by the Newton constant uh, times this distance delta squared. Okay? So, obviously this is a, this is a claim in gravity. This is a claim in semi-classical gravity. Um, and it's really just a guess. I mean, well, we made a guess. Um, actually, this was proven in a particular context of induced gravity, which is not the most general thing you could consider um, by Leichenauer and Levine. And so it's basically telling you if you, if you uh, look along some null ray, how much negative energy can you have there? Um, and hey, yes. So, sorry, before you erase this, can you uh, prove what you just erased uh, for holographic CFTs? Uh, sorry? Uh, whether you can prove the, those things that you had on the right uh, side of the whether you can prove them for holographic uh, CFTs, because that seems like a, it should, looks doable, right? Well, let's see. So this first statement about 2D CFT, I mean, that's just proven. Yes. Um, and I assume you could also prove it from the ball point of view, uh, yeah. if you feel like it. Yeah, but then what, what I'm saying is that that's probably uh, not too difficult to prove holographically. It's something about- uh, uh, Probably not. And then in 4D or in higher D, Probably you can uh, try to extend that proof. Yeah, so this, uh, well, this statement here is not about the null case. So do you want to yeah, talk about this case? Or? Well, whatever, we, whichever case. I think that uh, you go, you, I mean, if you consider a holographic CFT in whatever number of dimensions, yeah, you can formulate this as the behavior of some curves in the bulk, integrals yeah. along uh, some Classical, uh, classical quantities that you integrate along the curves in the bulk. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually exactly what these people did. So they said, yeah. because so the, here's a G Newton, so you need to have a little bit of gravity on the boundary. Yeah. So they kind of take like cut off ADS CFT. Okay. Uh, and then they take this kind of quantity and then they basically, just like you said, they, they, um, uh, they use the, the statement that there, that there shouldn't be shortcuts through the bulk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then they prove this, this result. Okay. Um, the, the reason I wasn't stronger about their proof is because of some details. So, so like the, the real, so this is like a cartoon version. So the real thing that we propose has like a smooth smearing function here, mm -hmm. instead of just averaging sharply over this interval. And actually in quantum field theory, it's important that you have a, a smooth smearing function. And the thing that they prove actually doesn't require that. So, um, it, yeah, in some details, the thing they proved is stronger than what I think could possibly be true. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a little bit of a, I mean, they, they did a correct thing, but then the, what's not totally clear is, is how big this, this regime yeah. is where this induced gravity is a good description. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, yeah, in terms of things though that, that you could prove, so, so um, if you want to prove this more generally, that it would be nice to have a field theory version. Uh, and the natural field theory version is to take the same quantity um, there's always null along some null ray with some null. And, and now what we have here is some measure of the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, and we have the UV cutoff to some power. Uh, and then we again have this delta squared. So this thing, by the way, is supposed to be true in any dimension, at least in high enough dimensions. Um, the dimensions somehow always work out here because of the G Newton. Uh, if we go to field theory, then um, we, we need to replace that G Newton with the UV cutoff. Uh, and now I think this is a, a checkable non-trivial statement. Um, it, it relates to this one. Because if you assume this thing, and you also assume the lore that G Newton should be smaller than 
L U B to appropriate power divided by N, um, then you derive this, this result. So this is something that you could try to prove. Um, but what, one thing that you can see here is that this is not really a nice quantum field theory statement because it has the UV cutoff in there, right? So you might like to prove something in quantum field theory that has, that has no UV cutoffs. All right, so, so that's the question. So what's a quantum field theory statement? Without any LUV. And the way you should think about that LUV is we're taking an operator where we just integrate over a light ray. And the fact that we get some LUV here is basically telling us that the operator is not really a good operator in the continuum quantum field theory. Because that's too much, it can get too much contribution from high energy modes. Um, so the obvious thing to try to do, which is also physically well motivated, is you should probably smear or average over more directions. Right, so if you take some, so let's say, T and X. So instead of just thinking about this operator, um, we should think about smearing this operator a little bit in both directions. So in the, in the delta minus direction as well, as well as the delta plus direction. You could also think about smearing it along the light sheet in the transverse directions. Uh, and then you can imagine bounds on the right hand side that don't involve the UV cutoff. But at the moment, we haven't proven any of those things, even in, even in free field theory. OK, so that, that, that's one fun question um, to try to answer. Um, roughly, you'd expect that this LUV to a power will be replaced by uh, like the space-time volume in this, in this um, parallelogram here. Um, yeah, and one, one thing is, you know, this lambda is an affine parameter, so um, this whole left-hand side scales in a certain, you can always rescale the affine parameter. The left-hand side rescales in a certain way. And so, like, the, the power that appears here is basically determined by the symmetry under rescaling the affine parameter. Can I ask one thing? Yes. So in the 2D version, you don't get this dependence on LUV basically because of uh, dimensional arguments, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then in higher dimensions, you have to get rid of that somehow. You have to introduce a scale in some yeah. way. And then if you want to do away with that, then uh, you have to come up with uh, something that replaces that, uh, that scale. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, exactly. So as soon as you say you want to consider this, this thing, then this, this has certain dimensions. So first of all, we have the rescaling under lambda. Um, and so we need, we, we have to put, we, we have to put delta squared there. That's required by the rescaling of the affine parameter. Yeah, and now as you say, we need the, we need the overall dimensions to be this dimensions mm -hmm. of the stress tensor. And then, yeah, you need a dimensional thing there. Yeah. yeah. So then if you want to do something without the UV cutoff, what length are you going to introduce? Yeah, so I think like a nice, um, so let, let's say we integrate, um, let's say we integrate over, over like the x plus as well as x minus. Um, then, you know, I think we can get like in four dimensions is, is uh, something like that. We probably still need the number of degrees of freedom there. So some central charge. So, because this is this is like invariant under boosts. So that, that that's the type of thing that you can expect. Okay, thanks. There's another thing that's also consistent with dimensional arguments, which is involves just taking a single light sheet and uh, averaging over the transverse direction. So instead of this thing, you can put some like transverse area A. But if you look at it in detail, you actually find that that bound is just not correct. So you can find counterexamples. But this one I don't have counterexamples for. 
I think the, the, the maybe general lesson is that uh, for a general quantum field theory operator, um, you need to smear it a little bit in order for it to be a well-defined operator. Um, and in general, smearing in space is not enough. Smearing in time is what you need to do because that controls the high frequency stuff. Uh, and if you smear in both of these directions, you smear in time a little bit. So I think that's probably what you need to do to get like a, a good quantum field theory operator. Uh, and if you think about the, the gravity application, this is also like a very nice, uh, this is a very natural kind of thing, right? Because you would think like, okay, I don't actually care about like a single geodesic. I care about, um, you know, some, some small region of, of null geodesics. Or if you just think about what you could measure, right? You would always measure the null energy average over some region like that. Um, Okay. Other questions about so this? This is kind of like so we, we propose one condition, but I think really there's many more things um, that could be done there. Um, what once you so now let me talk a little bit about the other side of this. So if you assume something like this smear null energy condition. Then, of course, the whole point was to say something about what sort of space times you can have, right? Um, and so what can we say about singularity theorems? Right, so for these traversable wormholes, at least the ones in asymptotically flat space, um, we were able to make some progress using these um, averages over infinite null geodesics. But we didn't make any progress there on, on these trapped surface type theorems, right? The, the, the thing that's in the original Penrose theorem, where you say if you have a trapped surface, then you'll have a singularity, okay? Um, so for this, um, so this is some work with um, Eleni and um, Demetrios. Uh, and it's using some, some earlier work by um, Eleni and Chris Buster. Um, and so basically the, the question is, if you, have, if you have an energy condition like this one, then what kind of singularity theorem can you prove from that? Okay? And the, the type of theorem that they showed you can prove is, suppose you have some distance here along an all ray, L0, where the null energy condition is violated. Okay, so this would be relevant near a black hole, right? Because we know that the null energy condition is violated uh, near the black hole horizon. Uh, and now we want to say, okay, where is the singularity? And then we measure something about the, the expansion at this point. And we want to say something about whether there's a singularity in the future. Okay? And what they basically showed here, which we adapted to the case of black holes, um, is that you need to have a singularity if this expansion is smaller than uh, a certain negative number, which is more or less minus one divided by this distance here. Okay? I should say that we haven't worked out 100% of the details, or rather, Eleni has worked out 100% of the details, but I don't know all of them yet. Um, so what you can do is you can apply this to a black hole. You think about some trapped surface that you have inside. Um, you know that the, the null energy condition is being violated out here. And so basically, um, if you have a trapped surface here, some distance um, a little bit inside the black hole. So at a value of the radius, which is the Schwarzschild radius times like 0.8 or some order one number like that, then you can prove that there will be a singularity in the future light cone of that, of that point. Okay, so basically you can try to go back and prove these kind of singularity theorems but now making this weaker assumption about some sort of, sort of smeared um, non-energy condition. 
Okay, so there, there's two like big open questions here. The, the first question is, uh, is our proposed condition actually the correct one? And then the second one is, what kind of singularity theorems can you can you prove from that? So how large is this L naught? Yeah, so uh, in, in general, it, it's up to you. So it depends on what you know about the space time down here. So it's to your benefit to make this as large as possible. So if you have the non-energy condition violated in a big region, then you, you can take this L naught to be big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in this case, uh, we can only take L naught to be of order the, the Schwarzschild radius because, or even smaller, because um, the null energy condition only st starts being violated at like, you know, uh, about like 1.3 times the Schwarzschild radius. It depends a little bit on the details of your quantum fields. Okay, so the basic statement here is if the null energy condition is violated in some region, which you can calculate, you know, knowing your semi-classical fields, then you have to have a singularity. All right, so I, let me kind of summarize. I, I do want to mention one um, kind of different approach that's sort of complementary to this one. Um, and, but I'm going to only mention that in like one sentence. So another approach uh, involves this quantum focusing conjecture, um, which was proposed by um, Busso, Fisher, Leichenauer, and Wall. And what they said is, Basically, there's a, there's a different way that you should deal with all of this kind of stuff. Instead of thinking about these old-fashioned things like the area and worrying about violating the, the null energy condition, you should just take the area everywhere and replace it with what you could call like the quantum area, which is the usual area plus 4 times g times the entanglement entropy. Uh, and then if you believe their quantum focusing conjecture, you can kind of prove singularity theorems, but now everything in terms of this quantum area. So that, I think that's a very interesting approach. Um, I don't really know if this quantum area is like measurable. So I think it's still useful to have these sort of old fashioned kind of things in terms of quantities you can actually measure. But I think there's um, still interesting connections between that, that approach and the, and the other approach. Um, but I, I think the dream here would be that we never, we, we only, we rewrite everything in terms of the quantum area. And really the thing I want to know about this is, I like this idea of the quantum area, but then I'd like to know, like, can you combine all those quantum areas into a quantum metric? And uh, like do GR with that quantum metric or, or what? Um, okay, so l let me then summarize. The, and say a little more about the open questions. Um, so we have this basic question, which is about the allowed space times. And I think we've learned in recent years that space times that we used to think were not allowed, are, can really physically occur, okay? And that's really a question about allowed space times like in, in real life, okay? Um, so there are some rules that are known, like this average null energy condition in Minkowski space. There are some rules that are suspected Uh, like this self-consistent achronal average null energy condition. There are some rules that have been proposed, like the smear null energy condition. But I think what we have is we have more questions than we have answers about this stuff. Um, both uh, at the level of quantum field theory and at the level of, of semi-classical gravity. Um, and 
yeah, these are I'm mostly focused on on like black holes and wormholes, but these are of course also relevant in cosmology and the early universe. Um, and I think it's a very interesting area, and I will work on this. But I think there's plenty of room. I'm not going to manage to do every interesting thing in this area. So um, I think there's a lot of room also for you guys to do interesting stuff. So thank you for having me. So it's a great pleasure that you have provided such elaborative uh, introduction to the subject. Now I am uh, requesting to all the participants, please unmute yourself and ask questions. And before that, please uh, give a clap for him for giving such a nice introduction. So please uh, ask questions. Everybody have asked questions? Interesting. A lot of people left. So the guys who are the master student, are you benefited with this lecture? Or like Bhubanesh, Ganesh, you have asked some questions initially. Is are you benefited with this? Nobody is saying anything. Hanes, you have a hello. Uh, yeah, please say. Hello. I am not Anish, but <laughs> I'm Adan. Yes, I benefited a lot from this discussion, uh, from this presentation. It was a really nice presentation. So for me, I had already, um, let's say I'm not in the field now of, of, of wormholes and of quantum gravity, etc. I'm in a field of statistical physics now, but I had a master in theoretical physics and I'm always interested in these topics. And it was really interesting. And yeah, so thank you for the presentation. It was Toby, do you have any question? Uh, nothing immediate, I think. Anne? Yeah, I think um, I want to ask something. Um, so I think, so after listening now to your talk, I think uh, the definition basically of what a wormhole is, um, is tied to the existence of these clapped, uh, closed, trapped surfaces. Um, right? Um, I think that's one issue, actually. So in, uh, if we have like a asymptotically flat space time, I think I know what the definition of a wormhole is. Uh, because we have some kind of topologically non-trivial cycle in the space time. I'm not sure that I know the definition. Um, <laughs> I define it. I'm not sure that I know the definition uh, in general, but I think the one you proposed is probably a good one. I mean, I think the definition people use is that, well, it kind of looks like a black hole from the outside, but then there's no singularity, which uh, is not a very precise definition. Um, so I haven't actually thought about what the price precise definition should be, but yeah, probably it should involve the trap surface. Okay. Um, and then my second thought about this was, um, I mean, even for like Schwarzschild black holes, you can find um, foliations um, in which you don't find a trapped surface. Um, yeah, you mean there's like some slices that don't contain any trapped surfaces? Yeah, I mean those those slices yeah. are of course not generic. Uh, so usually, for normal slices, you would find it, but you can find those special cases. Yeah. And as long as these special cases exist, I wonder if um, such a definition in terms of a closed trapped surface would be sufficient. Well, but I think you can ask the question of whether there's closed trap surfaces without choosing a foliation, right? Yeah, so you say um, you have a wormhole 
if there is some foliation where you have this trapped surface. Probably. Yeah, I mean, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, the definition of a trapped surface uh, doesn't require a foliation, right? You just take your surface and you can compute the null normals to that surface and you calculate what happens to them. Um, so I think you can use that definition without mm -hmm. talking about a foliation. Any other questions, guys? I want to ask some maybe like uh, very uh, general question, maybe not that. Yeah, but I just want to ask because, so you have mentioned about the ADS, one hole from ADS. So is it possible to construct similar kind of thing in DS in four dimensions as well? Um. Well, I mean, you can certainly take, you know, this Maldacena construction, which was in flat space, mm -hmm. and you can squeeze that into the sitter. I mean, you know, you can put that in our de sitter space by just making the black hole small compared to the cosmological horizon. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so that's kind of a boring thing you can do. Um, now, there's maybe a more interesting question of like, you know, when you start to make the black holes of a similar size to the de sitter radius, whether the sitter space makes it easier or harder to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't really thought about that. And like, if you uh, like want to understand along this direction, I, I just want to understand from a different perspective. So like, uh, what are the signatures or something, what uh, people expect in near future in the, so these guys are gravitational waves guys, this Hannes, okay. So I, I don't know, like, is, 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 yeah, he's from gravitational waves. So is this, there is any hope to get certain kind of feature or signature from wormhole in near future? Um, or if it is so, then what should be the signature according to you? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I haven't personally worked on this too much. I, I know that, um, for example, yeah, I'll probably be unfair in my citations, but for example, these people in Lofen, like um, Thomas Hertog and uh, Bert Ficknocke, uh, they, they looked at this from a sort of more phenomenological point of view. Um, I don't know if their thing was exactly a wormhole in this sense, but you know, they, they looked at like, um, yeah, how would the gravitational waves be different? Or they probably looked at the quasi-normal modes. I, I don't remember all of the details. So, so people have looked at that a little bit. Um, I, I think it's true that like these kind of objects would have different quasi-normal modes. So I think if, if they're out there, um, then you should be able to see them in gravitational ways. Now, um, with these particular, the ones I looked at in, in the most detail were these um, ones you can construct in the standard model. Um, and those are very small. So, <laughs> you know, their, their, their Schwarzschild shield radius should be small compared to like the Compton wavelength uh, of the charged fermions that you're using. So these are really kind of from some point, they're not like Planck scale, but they're like micro scale black holes. So uh, that's a pretty significant obstacle to doing gravitational wave observations. Uh, yeah. Is there any other way or uh, to connect something with some other thing so that, like, I can understand it is very, uh, like, uh, problematic to detect the gravity waves out of that, but is there any other way according to you? I'm just oh. asking you because, like, I am trying to connect something through which people can motivate themselves. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. And I, um, I don't think I have very satisfactory answers right now. So, yeah, so what, what would these things, yeah. So I was interested in, in them sort of as a like theoretical laboratory, but it would be great if they were like a real <laughs> thing that occurred. You could imagine that they would be like the dark matter. Yes. Or, or something like that. Yes. Um, but I don't think there's yet a very like um, persuasive production mechanism. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so I don't think I can give a strong argument uh, on that side. Unless you want to comment on that, because you are the true gravity wave scientist. Um, comment on something, if you want. So I think since um, wormholes look like black holes from far away, um, the in spiral would look very similar to black holes. Um, yeah, but it would be interesting definitely but to know whether... whether how to distinguish from yeah. the... That yeah. I... so, so probably, probably when, they, when they merge with something, it will look different. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, one, one, I think probably the most obvious thing about these particular ones uh, is that they're magnetically charged. Yes. And um, we're pretty good at detecting like electric fields. So that, that would probably be like the most obvious signal, like before you get into all kinds of details of the geometry. I think the magnetic charge would be the first thing that you would see. Yes. Any other question, guys? Yes. Can I ask a question in this, in this to continue? Do you think, uh, both of you, uh, do you think um, that if there is a gravitational waves emitted from these wormholes, do you think that they will be high frequency one or low frequency one? I mean that, do you, need, do you think that they will be uh, detected by a LIGO, uh, an Earth-based uh, observatory or by an ELISA type, let's say? That is saying no? that Ben pointed that, uh, like, Ben, you can please continue this. No, no, go ahead. I think you're doing well. Yeah, you please, please. <laughs> no, I was just saying that these ones are, are at the moment, they're, they're very small. So I don't think any conceivable, you know, you need a mini, a mini Lego. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how we're going to make that. Yeah, so that would be very high frequency and very small amplitude. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like very difficult, but yeah. That's I mean, uh, so I don't know, maybe you can construct like bigger ones. And, and then, then it would be sensible to talk about trying to see them in gravitational waves. Because yeah, we don't know all the rules, but th these particular ones, I think, um, Another one I just want to ask that uh, to construct this kind of wormhole in DAS or ADA space, particularly the dimensionality of the space time is important. I don't know. It was kind of important for what we were doing because, um, like, well, whatever, we had these magnetic fields which behave kind of differently in different dimensions, and then we had these. Um, these charged fermions, which were very convenient in 4D. But um, I mean, I don't think there's something deep about that. I think maybe you just need to use slightly different ingredients in different dimensions. I mean, you know, like uh, Maldacena and Key co constructed these sort of things in ADS2. Yes, yes, that's why I'm asking. So, they did it for two and like, so someone can construct in higher dimensions or not. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, like the details of our construction are for 4D, but um, yeah, I don't think 4D is particularly special from that point of view. Okay, so like uh, other people have no other specific question. If not, then I will end the session. Abhinash, do you have any question? Uh... No, no, I, I don't have a question. Thanks for the talk. And Deepak, Deepak, you want to say something? Hi, Deepak, can you able to hear me? I don't know. And Andre, you, you, you want to say something because, hello? Uh, hi, I guess I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Thank you for asking. So I hope, Ben, you have also enjoyed that uh, discussion and the session. 
and it, it, it was really enjoyable for us as well that you have explained uh, quite a detailed thing and uh, once I will put it in YouTube, I believe that the other people, those who are working and not also working, they will be uh, motivated from this. And uh, I'm requesting the other participants, those who haven't uh, like haven't asked any question right now. If you have any uh, question later, you can write to him. And uh, if I post it in YouTube, the viewers, please, if you have any question, then please contact him. Because this is kind of uh, like, if you can be benefited out of that, it would be very nice for the forum. So Ben, you want to say something? No, thank, thanks a lot for inviting me. It was fun. Thanks for coming. So uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, 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 maybe I, uh, I will invite you again with some of your new idea or new understandings uh, in near future. So um, I will get in touch with you anyways. Uh, that's not an issue. And I will share the link of this talk once I will post it in YouTube. Okay, okay great. See you guys. Bye. Bye.